Hello. So today we are taking a look at the startup procedure for the Boeing 747 in Microsoft Flight Simulator. This is the stock Boeing 747 that comes with the simulator that everybody has. Following the recent aircraft and avionics update for the simulator, it has really been transformed into actually quite a good aircraft. So we're going to work through the startup sequence for the aircraft and then take it for a quick flight just to try it out. I will be following a written checklist that I've updated that goes through all the things you need to do throughout the aircraft to get it up and running. So I will make a link available to this um, in the notes of the video so you can go and download it and use it if you wish. Okay, so we'll get inside the aircraft and the first thing we need to do in the 747 is configure our controls. So if we just have a look across the cockpit. I've got various videos about configuring controls, so I'm not going to go into too much detail on this today. We're just going to make sure that our controls are configured correctly. So I've got control of all the throttles. I've got spoilers. I've got flaps. I've got rudder, ailerons, elevators. So everything's looking good. Okay, so let's start working our way through the checklist. So we press control seven to go overhead first. We uncage the battery. We turn the battery on and we recage the battery. If we have external power available, we can enable it. And you can see various things light up around the cockpit when we do that. We can then set the standby power to auto and we can turn the APU start switch to start and it will fall back to on all on its own. So if we go and have a look outside the aircraft, the APU or auxiliary power unit is a small jet engine in the back of the aeroplane. And you can actually just about hear it firing up. So you'll see that hot air is starting to come out of the exhaust at the back of the plane. So the APU is a small jet engine. It's used to generate electricity inside the aircraft. It's also used to generate compressed air, which is then used to spin up the gas turbine engines. So we're just waiting for the APU generator switches to light up saying that it's available to use. And here it comes. So now we compress the APU Gen 1 and 2 switches and the cr it is cross-feed or cross-feeded, I don't know if that's the correct word, over to using the APU. So it's disabled the external power now. Okay. So the next thing we do is press Control and 8 on the keyboard and we go and set the inertial navigation system to nav so there are three systems we turn all three to nav now in the real world this will take seven or eight minutes for it to align itself it uses gyros so they have to settle down align and calibrate themselves so in the simulator if we press control and four we can go and look in the flight management computer if we press the menu button and then go into settings we can actually choose how real this is. So we can either have real time, accelerated or instant. So yeah, I'll just leave that for you to go play with to see what difference that makes. So we'll put it back on menu page for the moment. So I'm gonna press control and eight again. So that was the inertial navigation system. We've just switched on to nav across the board. Okay, so do we then go and arm the emergency lights? So we've switched this into the middle position and then we close the lid on it. So then we go back further down overhead, so control seven to come back down. We turn the nav lights on, so that informs ground crew that we are on the airplane doing things. We go and turn the window heat on while we're here. We turn the wing and anti-ice to automatic, so the middle setting. And now we can go and program our route into the flight management computer. So control and four brings us back down to the flight management computer. We can go into the FMC pages. The first page you see in FMC is just a data page showing you what version of the AIRAC data you have, or the navigation data. So that's fine. We can go to position initialization first. We can pick up the GPS location by clicking the soft key next to it. So any fields you see with square boxes are mandatory fields. So you'll notice when we clicked on that field, it put it into the scratch pad where we can actually key things in. Yeah, so you can see those letters appearing and we can also clear them back out. So I can drop that field by clicking the soft key next to a, an empty field and it populates it and it disappears in this case once you've done it. We can put in our reference airport. We're at Stansted. So the ICAO code for Stansted is Echo Golf Sierra Sierra. So we'll drop that in 
and that's an optional field but we're going to fill it then we can go to the root and notice in most Boeing FMC's it carries over the reference airfield so I think that might be a mistake that it hasn't done so so we're going to rekey Echo Golf Sierra Sierra is the airfield we are leaving from and the destination we're going to fly straight back into Stansted we're just going to do a circuit basically just to try some things out the runway we are departing on is runway 22 today to suit the wind we're not going to bother with a flight number so we can activate that route and execute those changes so we've now got a very very basic route in the head of the computer the next thing it wants us to do and this is a common theme in Boeing FMC's or flight management computers is the next thing to do is at the bottom right typically so performance initialization so we come in here we can put in our cruise altitude we're going to fly at 5,000 feet today we'll drop that in cost index cost index is a formula actually it's quite complicated but it governs how aggressively the air aircraft can accelerate or climb or how efficiently it you know uses its fuel load so we'll drop 100 in you would typically get this number from your operational flight plan so if you're using Simbrief for example you'll be able to pick up the cost index from the the OFP zero fuel weight if you just click this once it pre-calculates it for you then click it again and it will drop it in we can put in how much reserve fuel we want so We'll put one ton of fuel and in it goes and we can execute these changes as we go then we can go on to thrust limit so this is our climb out performance so by default it will use all the power available but you can derate the engines so you can run them less aggressively during climb which obviously reduces your climb rate but you use less fuel so then we can skip straight past that and go to takeoff so we can configure the takeoff parameters for the aircraft so if we put in 10 degrees of flaps which is pretty standard for a 747 you would only go to 20 if you are on a short field for example or you're incredibly heavy maybe so 10 degrees on the flaps and it's pre-calculated the rotate speeds but also we can do the center of gravity and again it will pre-calculate so we click it once it calculates it click it again drops it in and works out the trim number we'll come back to that in a moment so it's pre-calculated the rotate speeds so v1 is your maximum speed before you make a decision to stop if you're you know if you're aborting your takeoff so we can just click the button next to each of these to confirm them so if when we click the button it goes to a bigger number without the greater than sign next to it so then we've got the rotate speed and the v2 speed so there's a takeoff gross weight we don't really need to worry about that it's if you were doing a long taxi or you're held for a long time you might go and update that so thrust limit comes back around in a circle so those pages will go back on themselves so once you've done your performance data you've got the basics into the system we now need to tell the system how we are going to leave Stansted and how we're going to arrive so we go to the dep r button so it knows already because we said our reference runway was 2-2 or our departure runway was 22 so it's already selected we're not going to use a standard instrument departure today nor do we have to okay so we'll just leave that alone we'll come back to the index for the dep r button or we could press it again and we'll go and set up our arrival into stansted so we'll click the button next to it we're going to come back in ils on runway 22 we're not going to use a standard approach route so we're just going to say execute that um, and then we can go and look at the legs page and see what's happened as a result of that so you can see we're leaving Stansted then it doesn't know what we're doing once we've taken off and then it's following some um, procedure to get through the ILS so in this true sense of here's one I prepared earlier I've got a quick flight plan sketched out so we'll just put these waypoints in so ek veg will be our first waypoint so e k v e g so we're just typing that into the scratch pad then we drop it onto the the empty part of the flight plan and in it goes and we can execute that you don't have to execute everything as you go you can make all your changes in one go if you want to so then we'll go on to oduku so o d u k u we'll drop that on top of the field we want or sorry on top of the leg we want to push down yeah, so Oduku now follows Ekveg and CF22 has moved on and there's now a gap where it doesn't quite know what to do after we get to Oduku. So after we get to Oduku, we'll go to Brain. 
So B R A I N. Drop that on the empty field. And again, there's more than one brain in the world, so it's showing us the two latitude longitudes for them. It's the 51 degree one for the UK. Abbott is our next um, waypoint, so A, B, B, O, T. So notice we're doing all these changes without executing them, so we have a modified route at the moment. Yeah. And then Totvo will be our last waypoint, coming back in towards the runway. So Totvo. So notice we can't see the discrepancy, or sorry, discontinuity, so we have legs are showing up, so we can go next page. So to close up a discontinuity, we select the next leg and then select the discontinuity and it will pull everything up on the flight plan to close the gap. And then we can execute that change. So we can go next page again just to check there aren't any more discontinuities and we're looking good. So we now have the basic route programmed in. We've got the uh, performance data in. We've got the uh, everything we need, basically. So the flight management computer is done at this point. So I'm going to carry on down my checklist and see what we need to do next. So control two will take us to the master control panel for the autopilot. So let's work through the things we need to do here. We're going to press B to shortcut calibrating the altimeters. So you saw the altitude ribbon move there. If you want to do that by hand, you would look up the millibars or hectopascals on a, or inches even, on a, um, a meta report. And you would use the knob up here so you would set the correct scale and then use the knob to set the altimeter to be accurate to your departure airfield. So B is a shortcut to do the same thing on the keyboard. So we're going to go and turn the flight directors to on. So both of them come on when you flick one of them. It's worth knowing that. So it's worth having a little talk about this. The, the autopilot on the big jets, there's two parts to it. There's the flight director and then there's... Let's come to one side so we can see this easily. There's the flight director which puts these magenta bars on the attitude indicator. The flight director is watching where the aeroplane is and where the route is taking us, and it's figuring out what the aeroplane needs to do to get to where it needs to be going. We've got an aeroplane spinning around, an AI plane over there. We'll just crop him out of the shot. The, um, yeah, so the flight director is figure, figuring out what the aeroplane needs to do, and then the autopilot basically just follows what it's asking it to do. So you'll see these crosshairs moving around when you're on autopilot. So that's the aeroplane figuring out what it wants the autopilot to do. And then the autopilot chases those crosshairs with the control inputs. Okay, so we're gonna go and set the heading to our takeoff runway direction. So we're gonna preset it. So we're gonna pull this back around to 222 degrees, which is the, the actual direction of runway 22 at Stansted. Okay, so once the flight directors are on, you can actually pre-arm. So if we select heading mode there, so by clicking the button, you can see heading selectors come up. By the same token, we could set our vertical speed as well. So if we go vertical speed mode, it will light up. As long as the flight directors are on, it will switch on. And we can pre-select and say we would like to climb out at, say, 2,500 feet a minute, for example. We can also set our target altitude for the climb. So we'll go to 5,000 feet today. So we just press the knob as well to confirm it. So then we've got a target altitude here as well. Okay. So obviously in flight, we could use lateral navigation as well, which means the airplane will follow the flight plan. So instead of using heading mode, we can use LNAV. So you can see heading select and LNAV are selected. So as soon as the autopilot comes on, it will switch to LNAV. And then it mean, that means it will follow the route completely automatically. As long as it's got, you know, a route without any discontinuities in it. OK, so. We have set up the master control panel. Now we're going to go and press control three. We're interested now in this stabulator uh, a graph or chart whatever you want to call it so the green area is the where you need the trim to be for the elevators so we're going to move the elevator trim back into the center of here so this means the aircraft will not be trying to push its nose into the floor or to raise its nose at the rotate speed yeah so as you accelerate along the runway the airplane will essentially be flying in equilibrium at zero altitude 
so you won't have any surprises as you get to your rotate speed you'll be able to use the stick and gently pull the nose up and you know off to the races okay so we go back overhead we're going to get ready to start the engines so we're going to go and turn on the fuel pumps so you turn on the fuel pumps for the tanks that have fuel I know for a fact in the default configuration before you do anything in the 747 in flight simulator there's nothing in the centre tanks therefore I'm not going to turn on the the pumps for the centre tanks you will get warnings on the screens in the cockpit if you've got an empty tank and the pump is on okay so at this point we would perform pushback because you wouldn't start the engines when you're at the gate but we are not at a gate we're out on a parking stand so we can start the engines without performing pushback so to start the engines we go control 7 we go and turn the beacon light to both down here so that informs the ground crew around the aircraft we're about to start the engines we go and turn on the apu bleed across all four engines so that allows the compressed air that the uh, that the auxiliary power unit is generating to spin up the engines okay but we're not actually spinning them up yet so if we come to the normal pilot view so you can see this easily we're going to pull out the knob for the starter for engine number four first and if we look on the screens down here you've got the n2 number is accelerating so that's the gas turbine and the n1 number which is the um the turbo fan so when the N2 number gets to 20%, just waiting for it, waiting, 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 we can switch on the ignition or the starter switch for engine number four. And you will see fuel has come into the engine and been ignited. The exhaust gas temperature is raising. The speed of the gas turbine is increasing. Oil temperature is coming up. Oil pressure is coming up. Yeah, it's all looking good. So if we go and look back overhead, you'll see the um, the start button or start what would you call it plunger for number four falls back in all on its own so then we can pull number three and we do the same again so we're waiting for the gas turbine to be spun up by compressed air till it gets to 20 percent of its nominal speed so it's just coming through 10 11 12 and so on we just sit and patiently wait for it and there goes the starter so you might be wondering can i start all of them at once yes you can but you'll have to wait a lot longer for them to spin up because there's a finite amount of air pressure so doing them one at a time is the more sensible way to do it okay so waiting for number three to fall back in There it goes, engine number two. So waiting for the gas turbine to spin up. Nineteen twenty. So we can then switch on the ignition or the start switch for engine number two, and it carries on. The exhaust gas temperatures raising. Oil temperatures and pressures are still coming up. So yeah, this 747 is a lot better than it was. It's better than the Salty mod even. I'm really impressed with it. And finally, engine number one. So 17, 18, 19, 20. So I think the actual name of these levers is the fuel control levers. Okay, so we just wait for that engine to come up. The plunger will fall back in just as the others have. Just wait for that to happen. Okay, done. So control seven brings us back overhead. As soon as the engines are up and running, we can turn the APU back off. So we just turn the APU to off. We can now go to the hydraulic pumps 
obviously this would have happened after pushback typically obviously we're nowhere near anyone so we can go and enable the hydraulics now the reason for doing this after pushback is so nobody is near the surfaces when they might start moving so obviously the hydraulic controls is nose gear all of the control surfaces of the aircraft so you don't want anybody near any of that stuff when the hydraulics comes under pressure and things start moving potentially Okay, then packs over on the far right so this is the environmental control system that provides the um, warm air or cool air to the aircraft as required and pressurizes the cabin taxi lights can go to on <coughs> excuse me so taxi goes to on and we can begin taxiing to the runway at this point so before we do that we're going to have a final look down so we've got apu cool down is happening doors are on auto parking brake is set so if you wanted to look at the doors we can also do seat belts we should have done that earlier really i haven't got it on my checklist i don't think we can control the door yeah there's no control for the doors in the aircraft at the moment which is a bit of a shame but we've got the important thing is we've got no warnings up here this is just statuses okay so we can come off the parking brake and you can see we've got a very small amount of positive thrust at idle so the aircraft is gently moving so we're going to open the engine slightly and on our way out to the runway we're going to move the flaps to 10 degrees so you can see I've set the flap lever but the flaps are still moving so it takes them a while. So we just have a few extra bits and pieces to do once we get to the runway. So I'm just going to go to the outside view so you can see what's happening as we run over the baggage trolley. And ingest the generator into the number two engine. <laughs> So it'll be interesting to fly this circuit just to see how the aircraft behaves because I've heard a few people note that the approach mode isn't working for them. <clears throat> so I'll just go around, you know, put the aeroplane through its paces and see what happens. And yeah, we'll be ready to, to go manual if we need to on approach if it's not behaving itself. So people that complain that these big jets are difficult to handle on the ground, well of course they are, because they can sometimes weigh 750,000 pounds. So where's he going? That's an AI plane, isn't it? Of course he's going head on with us. Of course he is. He's going a hell of a speed as well. We'll completely ignore him. That's unusual. AI planes usually avoid you. Unless, of course, it's not an AI plane. Okay, so as we taxi out to the runway, we can start thinking about lights. So we'll go and turn our strobes on. So strobes over there. So once we get lined up on the runway, we'll go and turn on the landing lights as well. It's pretty standard practice to light the aeroplane up like a Christmas tree. If anyone ever wonders why I tend to use Stansted, it's because it's quieter. You get everybody and their dog tries to use either Gatwick or Heathrow. So it's quite a quiet airport to go and try things out at. 
course the problem then becomes people see these videos and they head to Stansted. <laughs> but now it's all good. I really should vary it around a bit more though. Okay, so we're just lining up. So landing lights can come on, they were on the wrong way. Just line us up nicely. So about 98, 99, I'm just manually controlling the throttles to see what how it goes. Doing pretty well. Okay, so full power. Waiting for rotate to go through on the indicated airspeed. It would help if I concentrated on the centre line, wouldn't it? Got a bit of a crosswind. So if nose can come up. So general guidance with the big jets is no more than three degrees a second on the rotate. So we'll arm the auto throttle, go for speed mode, and we'll go and turn on the auto autopilot, sorry, and it's gone for two and a half thousand feet a minute because we were climbing at five thousand feet a minute there, look, so the nose is coming down. We can start retracting the flaps. So the aeroplane is going back towards the track. So if we have a look, if we zoom out on the range, see what it's doing. So you can see there's our flight plan. So we're just coming up Climbing for 5,000 feet, we're holding just under 250 knots at the moment. It doesn't seem to be wonderful at catching the exact speed you've asked for, but that could be down to weather on the day. I'm running with live weather. It's quite a nice day in the UK today. It's a little bit breezy. So you can see there's 15 knots or so of headwind, but it's gusting which is maybe what's kicking the throttles around. Okay, so we'll let the aeroplane follow its route. I will say this, um, the symbology now on the EFIS screen is much better than it used to be. So if we zoom back in on that a little bit, just to see this corner coming, to see how well it manages turning the corner. So if we watch outside as well, as that happens. So you'll see the flight director kick across any moment to start the aircraft turning. So it's basically the flight director, there it goes, it's asking the autopilot we need to do some left stick. So you can see that happen with the yoke. It's very cool isn't it? So the guidance of following a track seems to be much better than it used to be. So we will leave the landing lights down because we are below 10,000 feet. So we've got to see where we are on the map. We're just making the turn at Ekveg out towards Oduku. So I'm going to pause the video here and I will um, unpause it when we are near to the approach so you don't sit here waiting for 10 minutes for me to get on with it. Okay so if we increase the range you can see we are just approaching Abbott and about to turn in towards the airfield so we are going to drop down to Let's just check first what the elevation of Stansted Airport is. So it's 348 feet, so we want to be about 2,900 feet for our descent. So I've just selected 2,900 feet and it's doing a flight level change to get there. In the same time period we're going to 
slow the aircraft down now. So notice it's lifting the nose up so it's favouring. Um, the de decreasing speed over decreasing altitude. So to help it do that in time we're going to use the spoilers. Notice though on the ribbon we're getting close to stall speed so we're going to start putting the flaps out as well. So you can see the green banana has come in because we've got to our target speed now. It's allowing the nose to drop. So we can mitigate the risk of stalling by reducing the bank, the maximum bank angle that the autopilot can use. Okay, so we are below the glide slope at the moment. We are to the left of the localizer. Yeah, so that will make sense. So if we have a look at the map. You can see us coming in. We're quite early with getting to the correct altitude, so it's all good. So once we make the final turn, we'll configure the flaps and gear for landing. You can see the throttles coming up to maintain airspeed because we've now leveled out. So everything's working so far. So we haven't entered approach mode yet though, so we'll see what happens. The only rule is to enter approach mode is you need to be below the glide slope and fly into it from beneath. So we're making the turn. So we're going to go for the next stage of flaps. Going to get the gear down now. Slow down further. So there's the airfield directly in front of us. So here comes glide slope. So let's go for approach mode. So it's gone localizer. All of the autopilots, have, that's interesting, they've all come on automatically. I've never seen it do that before. So here comes the glide slope. So we'll pull the speed back now to 160 knots. Go for full flaps. And you can see the vertical speed has kicked in, so the aircraft is following the glide slope down. So I've not seen anything wrong with this so far, but maybe I'm just lucky. <laughs> so here comes the airfield on the map. Let's try something then. Can we get... so they haven't implemented approach mode on the EFIS display. That's that's a shame. Whether that's a mistake or whether that's something I'm not doing, I don't know. It's worth pointing out I have not been using, for this test flight, I've not been using ACARS. So obviously in a real situation you would, but you'd have it on TA only during approach, otherwise the autopilot could react to nearby traffic. So this has gone into flare mode automatically, obviously because it's got all the autopilots wired up. Or engaged, I should say. So it's allowing rollout and flare mode. So this is interesting. I'm going to leave it and see what happens. We'll do an auto land, essentially. Should 
Okay, watch this from outside. Try and get the camera so we can see it really closely. So, the puppy lights are looking okay. But it is wavering around a little bit, isn't it? It's chasing the speed. I'll let it slow down. How well will it do with the flare? Let's watch. 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. That's not bad. So let's straighten up. So air brakes out. Engines to reverse. So reversers can stay on until we get to about 80 knots. It's not going to slow down that easily, is it? So we're going to go for wheel brakes now, take the reverses off. Interesting. So the wheel brakes really don't, they're not up to much, <laughs> let's put it that way. But the 747 is very heavy, so they may not be in the real thing. So let's just slow down this last little bit. Yeah, we're going to go long. I'm not going to make that turn off. Okay, so that was... I thought that was okay actually. I didn't think it was too bad at all. So we're just going to use the nose wheel steering to go off the wrong way. Do we need to. Oh, we've still got. Oh, have we got a problem? I'm just looking at that autopilot. I think the autopilot was trying to hold it on the center line still, it hadn't disengaged. So there's a lesson right there for approach. You do need to disengage the autopilot. It won't take a control input to disengage it for you. Most of the Boeing aircraft, as soon as you put a uh, control input in, it will disengage. So we can get rid of the warning. So on the taxi back in, we can go and start the APU back up in case we don't have external power at the gate. But obviously, we're not going to do the whole journey back in today. This was all about just showing you the startup sequence and trying out a simple circuit and looking at approach mode, which was really just curiosity because so many people have told me it wasn't working, but I didn't see a problem with it. It even managed that deceleration on the final approach which I thought might have thrown it, but no, it was absolutely fine with it. Okay, so hopefully you enjoyed that. So that's the new... Well, we need to take the um, landing lights off, don't we? Now off the runway. And the strobes can come off as well. So this is the updated 747 in Microsoft Flight Simulator. Hopefully you enjoyed that. So as I said, I will put the links to my notes in the, the notes of the, the YouTube video for the, the startup procedure. Okay, see you again soon.